Welcome everybody. I should say, I should start by saying good morning for those, for those of you who are in a time zone where it's morning, good afternoon and good evening as well um, to all of you. Uh, this is the second um, seminar organised by the Research Centre for Professional Communication in English, RCPCE, and the Department of English and Communication. Um, we are delighted to have our friends and colleagues from York here today. Um, just before we start, I'd like to say just a few words about RCPCE that um, hosts, co-hosts these events. Um, so RCPC that has a lovely website um, within the um, department's webpage is um, invested in promoting applied research for the, uh, the purpose of advancing communication in English and um, allowing transfer knowledge um, to, of applied linguistics research really towards several communities. And one of the research strands that RCPC is also uh, nurturing as well as others is um, teaching um, related learning and teaching related research about language um, education. So uh, the talk that we are going to uh, watch and listen to today falls within that category. Okay, so our two um, guests, uh, Professor Christopher Hall and Dr. Claire Cunningham, they both work at the University of York St. John within the Centre for Language and Social Justice Research. Um, they both come to linguistics and language research from two different sort of backgrounds, but they're obviously not that different, otherwise they wouldn't be working together. Um, so um, Chris has extensive experience working abroad and uh, looking at issues of cognitive and social nature within uh, language, particularly looking at the ontologies of English for um, social justice and looking at how these ontologies of English translate into uh, practices really. And then Claire also aligning with these interests has looked at her research has looked at uh, multilingual practices, particularly looking at teachers beliefs in relation to um, learning and teaching practices. So the two of them bring together a host of ideas for us to learn about um, the ontological beliefs of um, EAL educators and therefore over to you too. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks very much, Sal. Um, and uh, thanks to uh, William and Catherine and Amos also, the team, um, for uh, arranging this and inviting us. We're delighted to be here. Thanks very much for coming. Um, we wish we could be there in person, right, Claire? <laughs> we certainly do. It's very disappointing not to be in Hong Kong right now. It is. Uh, <laughs> But it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here remotely anyway. And yeah, as uh, Sal said, what we're going to be doing today is talking about um, this project we, we've um, done together, collaborative um, thinking on the ideological and ontological beliefs of EAL educators. So uh, I'm aware that EAL may be an acronym uh, that might mean something else or that you may not be familiar with uh, in Hong Kong and other contexts. So just before we begin, uh, that's the acronym that's used in the uh, English education system to refer to uh, children who have linguistic repertoires which include languages beyond English. Um, so um, what we'll be covering today is um, very briefly, uh, I'll try to make it brief because we've got a lot of ground to cover, but some highlights of previous research just to contextualize uh, the project. Um, then uh, I'll hand over to Claire, who will talk about the research context and design and some of the um, uh, analysis we've done on the data we have on ideological beliefs. Then I'll come in again and talk about the ontological beliefs and we'll both wrap up with some conclusions and implications. Um, this project uh, arises from a work that was originally done by Claire. And in fact, Claire did all the heavy work on this project really, uh, because the data is hers. It's based on um, her PhD research, um, which she has published in a variety of um, publications. This one you can see on the screen, I hope. Can you see it? Is it working? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, a couple of years ago, published in uh, Language and Education. And we started talking about this um, because in, um, in parallel, I've been working with um, colleagues on ontologies rather than ideologies uh, of English. Um, and uh, 
we thought that maybe the framework that I've been developing for ontological analysis uh, would be a suitable vehicle to it, look at the, the uh, relationship between ideology and ontology in this uh, population of teachers. So in this book that came out last year, um, that's where you've got the, the fullest uh, working out of the ontological framework for English that I've been developing. And actually this work was published um, last year in linguistics and education. So this is kind of a potted version of uh, the full um, version of the project reported there. So, um, first of all, some definitions. Um, ideology, because we're looking at this interaction between ideology and ontology. Uh, this is the way that we um, defined uh, ideology in the article. So, the, it's beliefs that are pertaining to ideologies, uh, systems of ideas or meanings which constitute worldviews, basically. Um, social practices tied to values and power, yeah? And ontologies, on the other hand, are those beliefs, ontological beliefs concern basically what exists or what doesn't exist, uh, the nature of what exists, its status, and uh, how those things that exist are related uh, to each other. So, um, Starting with beliefs, um, because this is about teacher beliefs, um, most of the previous research on teacher beliefs has concerned learners and learning, teachers and teaching, rather than in the context of language uh, learning and teaching, the actual language um, itself and the, the realities that they are embedded in. So, for example, Alfaro and Bartolome, who worked out with um, the beliefs of bilingual educators, um, say that they, in the previous research, they've been treated as overly psychologized, apolitical constructs. So you see this in a lot of the teacher education literature. Um, work on teacher beliefs <clears throat> uh, about English and attitudes to English, <clears throat> however, are increasingly focusing on um, issues of social justice um, and these are inextricably linked then with language ideologies and work's been done in native speaker contexts, for example, about uh, non-standard or unstandardized English in the classroom, um, context of English as a foreign language learning and use, uh, so non-native speaker Englishes, which has been my uh, focus, and also bilingualism and translanguaging, which is more Claire's uh, focus. Um, language ideologies then, um, which are a very big part of uh, this work on teacher beliefs, um, are enmeshed with this idea of nation uh, and national ideologies, uh, nationality. Um, all the way back to Ina Haugen in, in the 60s, who, who said that the national ideal that emerged out of the Renaissance demands that there be a single linguistic code by means of which communication within the nation can take place. So nation and language start to get conflated um, um, historically. And now with the, the global status of English, uh, it, this is um, particularly the case uh, for the English language uh, in England. So you get this ide ideology of, the, of one nation and one language, which Fortier, um, who was, um, talking about um, applying for British citizenship and the discourse in, in this country around um, competence in English being part of British values. Uh, she pointed out that that whole logic of this ideology is shored up by the naturalized status of English uh, as an international language, which deterritorializes it, makes it seem uh, uh, like a, just a natural phenomenon. Um, so ideologies, uh, language ideologies, become incredibly uh, entrenched. So they become naturalized and the boundary with ontology, what we actually think exists, starts to get blurred. But um, it's important, I think, to point out that these ideologies can be variably distributed across groups and even within uh, individuals. Um, Van Dyck, for example, um, points out that 
individuals can be members of various ideological groups um, and so their um, experiences can feature sometimes contradictory personal opinions and other beliefs as influenced by different ideologies and we'll see that this will also uh, operate with ontologies as well. Um, I think I now pass over to Claire who's going to uh, talk about some of them. <laughs> so of course these ideological beliefs that Chris has been talking about impact significantly in the schooling context and there's been a strand of research developing um, investigating these beliefs in the USA looking at linguistic diversity in the classroom, as well as in Europe with people like Andrea Young in, in France and Naomi Flynn here in the UK, as well as my own work. And um, that has served to demonstrate that there remains a very embedded monolingual mindset and a very strong sense of the primacy of standard English in, in schools. In terms of investigating ontologies of language, um, discussions have been had within applied linguistics by, by Sargent, Harris, McConey and Pennycook and, and others we can see here. Um, but to date, um, work on understanding teacher ontologies of English has um, so far been confined to Chris's work and that collection ontologies of English, which he co-edited with Rachel Wickshack Sono in, in which we both have chapters. So Chris is now going to talk us through the development of a theoretical framework for combining the two. Um, and then I'm going to return to talk us through the research design of our study where, where this is applied to teachers in my data set. Pass back to you, Chris. <laughs> so um, what we're going to be seeing then is that uh, the ideological beliefs that teachers have, that everyone has, are actually underpinned by ontological belief. So we're trying to work through this connection between the two. Uh, and it hasn't been addressed really in previous research, or, uh, although uh, there, is, there are some indirect um, references to it. I think um, Philip Sargent's work has perhaps come closest to it um, uh, within the realm of English and, and global Englishes. Um, he says that um, ideology is involved in both um, the role of English, but also the, the, way, the ways in which uh, that English is, is researched, but that, as you can see in this quote here, they're both constrained to some extent by the nature of the language itself. Uh, and that is the ontological question. Um, and maybe what's the, the, what we think is the, the best way to, to conceptualize the relationship uh, is this insight from a, quite an overlooked article from the 1970s by Sharp, who said, any comprehensive worldview constitutes an ideology. Such a worldview will contain both an ontology and a set of values. So it's that interplay between ontology and values uh, that we see as, as central here. So um, here's a, a, a kind of sketch of a, a theoretical framework um, for relating beliefs, ideology, ontology, and attitudes together. So within this green box here, we've got beliefs, basically convictions. Um, that's um, a, a cognitive um, um, uh, sphere. Uh, and of course, we've got the postures or the positioning towards the outside world uh, that people will adopt. Within then uh, the cognitive sphere, we have beliefs, the ontological beliefs, which uh, we're adopting Sharp's definition if you uh, assign values, you attribute values to some of those um, ontological categories, uh, this uh, is what uh, gives rise to ideological beliefs. Now, of course, the ide ideological beliefs have their origin in the social experience of individuals. So um, that's uh, where they start, but their composition is in, in this framework, uh, sets of ontological beliefs and values. Also important to point out though that the ideological beliefs uh, can affect what we think exists. And as I said, the relationship between them is a little blurred. When we um, kind of apply these ideological beliefs to uh, things, people, languages in the outside world, then um, that's what we're calling attitudes. So these are postures based on um, the ideological beliefs we hold. 
So that's a brief sketch. Um, back to Claire now for some contextualization of the project. Okay, so with, with kind thanks to Chris for saying I did the heavy lifting here, this I guess is the report of, of that heavy lifting. And um, so the data for this, this paper and this exploration comes from my much larger PhD study, um, which was subsequently published in, in different papers as, as Chris pointed out in 2019 and 2020. And um, so I undertook a series of semi-structured interviews across seven, actually eight initially, primary schools in the north of England. Um, and, and I also spoke to one um, local education authority uh, group of staff as well. Um, and so I spoke to people who were all um, operating in different roles within the schools. So head teachers and deputy heads, EAL specialists, um, head uh, class teachers, um, teaching assistants and bilingual learning assistants as well as um, some members of staff who were family liaison officers and that kind of thing. So I got a really broad uh, range of participants in, in the study. And that's why we often focus on the word educator rather than teacher in, this, in reporting of this, of this data, because I wanted to reflect um, that aspect of the, of the study. So for the purposes of, of this paper, our research questions were, were based around understanding those ideological beliefs, first of all, um, and I'll talk you through the framework that we applied to, to look at that. And then our second question asks us to reinterpret that discursive data um, to pull from it the ontological beliefs applying Chris's ontological framework to that, um, and therefore uh, considering the nature of the relationship between the ideological and the ontological beliefs, as we can see in that discursive data. Oh, you've got a bit overexcited there, Chris. You flash back past my... There we are, beautiful. Now, I, I could probably spend 40 minutes talking about this framework, so I won't. Um, this the data in the initial project was analysed using the appraisal framework and um, that of Martin and White um, from the Australian context, which extends um, Mac Halliday's SFL um, and allows us to explore the expression of attitudes. Of course, this is of great value here if we think back to the theoretical um, framework that Chris has just introduced us to, because exploring attitudes allows us to um, start on picking some of those ideological beliefs to a, to a point. So the appraisal framework um, is based around three subsystems um, of, of analysis and it gives you a really systematic way to approach discursive data. It comes with its own problems and its own questions um, and we probably don't have time to explore them too much at the moment. Um, but this framework, as we can see here, has the systems of exploring attitude and the um, complementary subsystems of seeing how that attitude is being expressed through the use of graduation that makes a statement stronger or weaker, and through the engagement subsystem that allows you to explore to the, the extent to which an individual is expressing an opinion um, from their own perspective or incorporating others' perspectives. Um, so we can see how that's been actioned on the next slide. Um, so you can see how I went about coding um, a transcript here. We've got um, a statement from Lucy in which I've noted that there's quite a lot of judgment going on. Judgment and the capacity judgment was by far the, um, the largest category. Um, I spent some time thinking about why that was, and I think it's related to teachers spending a lot of time judging capacity. Um, but it turns out they do it towards parents as well, as we can see here. And so we can see that there's a polarity. Um, you're looking for either a positive judgment or a negative judgment in the various different categories. Um, so that was the approach that I took to analysis. Um, we're not, need to, not going to need to focus on that in any more depth. Um, I'll talk us through some of those ideological beliefs now, and then we can take a look at the subsequent ontological reinterpretation. So overall, 
the appraisal analysis uh, suggested that there were two or three main things going on here. There was a, a very strong hegemonic stance towards English, as we've already heard reference, then the notion of the one nation, one language ideology is very strong within this data set, possibly unsurprisingly, and that that leads to uh, a very strong uh, deficit model being applied to children who present uh, with languages beyond English in the home environment. There's also a, a really strong association of English as being top dog um, at the top of the, the language hierarchy. Um, and that actually other languages beyond English have uh, competition um, on, underneath that for positions on that hierarchy. What we also see is um, a uh, relative value being given to languages, um, which follows from that monolingual mindset, and it associates individual languages with individual communities, um, speech communities, um, and that can end up denying the, um, the notion of multilingualism as being a natural state within uh, the UK context, at least. So I'm going to uh, take us through the kind of five overarching themes, if you like, that we drew from uh, that ideological analysis. The first one of which you can kind of see reflected in the others, which is the notion that English is, is always primary. Um, it's something that many of the educators seem to believe almost unquestioningly, and that can actually end up rendering other languages uh, almost invisible. Um, so for example, Kelly, who is the EAL coordinator um, in school number two, it refers to people who've got no language at all when they come. And Irene, the head of school four, describes children coming into year three with no language. So these are all really negative capacity judgments. Um, we can see Tina talking about um, somebody who accelerated very rapidly from no languages, no language to lots of languages within six to 10 weeks. He's, he sounds amazing. Um, and the graduation resources here of this raising of intensification and the quantification also seem to be creating some kind of very um, hyperbolic narrative. So the exclusionary stance is actually made explicit elsewhere where, where the importance of English as the dominant language is really being focused on. Um, uh, but we do see English as being equated with language in general, as we do with those references to no language. Um, Thomas here talks about um, EAL students being transferred to other schools where there are better native speaker role models and returning when they've got more language. Again, just denying this um, the linguist repertoires of the, of the children. Marie speaks of the possibility of children entering school with a lower level of language. And Luke mentions the difficulties that EAL children have in processing language. Um, you can see the same kind of characterization in Lucy's um, uh, discourses as well, where she characterizes the parents' English as, uh, as being poor even more explicitly, explicitly. She then goes on to say, dad was very good at English, mum couldn't speak it at all, um, and the little boy was somewhere in the middle. So we had something. Dad could speak, mum couldn't. Maybe it's a cultural thing. Dads can all speak, mums can't, mainly. And so what we need to notice there is that although in the earlier part of the extract, she refers explicitly, to the mother's knowledge of English, with that capacity appraisal there, mum couldn't speak it. In the later part, there's no reference to English at all. So by dropping that pronoun, um, which we would see if, if, if English was still sort of uniquely being focused on here, Lucy's shifted her stance um, to one in which a lack of English is construed as a lack of ability to speak at all. Next slide, please. So that distinction between, there's a distinction between more valuable languages, um, which are um, made even more valuable by being taught in schools, and those that are less valuable, which are being brought to the schools from homes. Um, this does shake out when we have children in schools with languages beyond English that are European, um, and you see a distinct difference 
between the way that uh, teachers and educators will talk about children who are presenting in school with French or German or Italian in the home um, and, and what we see here um, with Habib, who's talking, he's um, a bilingual learning assistant, and he is talking here about um, the language that is useful for him to, to get his job is seen as an asset to him, um, but it's not a language that people go and learn. And so people go and learn Chinese and, you know, you learn French, but the children in his care see their first language as nothing special. Um, and so the children's languages are perceived, therefore, by the children themselves and their teachers as, as less valuable assets in that multilingual um, setting. Thank you. Beautiful animations. <laughs> So what we see um, emerging here from these um, educators' discourses is very consistent with the one nation, one language ideology, um, according to which each country essentially has a language with a privileged status. So that's English in the UK, it's Urdu in um, Habib's um, heritage country, for example. And it's consistent with a monolingual habitus, of course, whereby each individual is a native speaker of, of only one language and can only be. Um, individuals can um, and might well be expected to learn another language, although only one from the upper levels of the hierarchy, of course. Um, but their cu cultural heritage, their core identity is explicitly construed as being monolingual. And we can see that in these extracts here, um, which were taken from um, responses to questions about um, how desirable it is that children maintain their home languages. Sometimes the answers to this particular question were quite shocking and contained lots of pauses. Um, Lucy, however, um, was very positive in her talk and talks about how it's important to keep their natural language um, as it's an extremely important characteristic. It's part of their culture. It's who they are. It's what makes them unique. And Helen goes on to say something uh, similar. It's a big part of your identity. It's like something you pass down. And what's notable in both of these extracts is that use of the positive valuation alongside quite a lot of um, intensifying graduation as well, because it suggests an almost genetic or biological association between the children's heritage languages and their identities, which emphasizes that naturalizing effect of the ideology. For Lucy, multilingual students' first language is their natural language, um, implying that English is unnatural for them. Um, and for Helen, it's been passed down. Losing that would mean losing their identity um, because that scene has been explicitly tied to their culture and wherever they belong, which of course implies that they don't belong in the UK context potentially. So that typical EAL child is there or being absolutely defined by their home language and the cultural identity that that's seen to entail. So that goes some way to explaining how EAL children get positioned as problematic, as bringing problematic traits, linguistic traits with them, um, which of course reinforces that deficit model. Um, and it's also because they face this, this, this challenge as the teachers will see it as some sort of transition from what is a natural state of only having one language to a multilingual state, which the teachers find hard to comprehend. And so our fifth um, theme, before I pass back to Chris to take us from the ideology to the, to the ontology, is this notion that home languages are construed as having uh, significantly less worth in the schooling environment. We really, really don't want to suggest that educators, that teachers in this, in this study are somehow opposed to children using their first language. They were often extremely positive about the use of, uh, of children's home languages and they're desperate to somehow work out how to maintain um, children's home languages, whilst being relatively clear that it's not their job to do so, which I've reported elsewhere. Um, but crucially, the idea of holding on to the home language is nearly always constructed as having uh, a qualified worth, and that worth is often related to a transition to English. 
Um, so for, for example, Kelly states that parents should continue to use first language at home because that will improve the child's second language, um, i.e. English. Um, and that, that propriety judgment there of what the parents should do in the home, kind of uh, making judgments on what's going on there. Sheila comments on um, migrants' failure to understand that to learn English, they need to hold on to their, their, their first language. Um, that development in English will help, as Marie says, because then they can reinforce it in English. So you see, it's always this connection back to the primary, the primary language, as is seen. So elsewhere, um, as usually in the playground, in fact, children's use of languages beyond English is sanctioned, um, but it's largely for social or rapport um, building. Um, Lucy talks about when children use Tamil that it's really promoted and supported, but also talks about how there's a bit of a slight humour um, because the teachers don't understand what's going on, um, but they, but she talks about how heartwarming she finds it when children mm -hmm. speak Tamil together in the playground. So what we're kind of seeing here is this, the sense of the exotic as well, um, which is of course um, problematic in terms of being um, a quite othering within this, this process. Um, and of course it restricts, restricts the communication in Tamil to a very narrow social domain. Um, or we also see um, the, the restriction of home languages being um, subject to supervision by, by teachers or by um, classroom assistants. Um, Kelly, um, who is one of the most positive people about home language use in the school in bilingualism generally, um, she had said earlier on in her, in her talk with me that she's really into bilingualism and values it. Um, but she then does go on to say how much uh, children feel that they need to be chaperoned when using their, their home languages. They've got to learn to use it appropriately. And so there's lots of talk about the inappropriate use of home language um, in, in and around schools so that children need to be overseen um, in the use of their home languages. So I'll pass back to Chris now to take us from some of that exploration. You'll see some of this data crop up again as Chris re-evaluates it through the ontological framework. You're muted, Chris. It's very polite of you. I wish I had a, a, a prize for each time I've done that. <laughs> um, so yeah, the ontological framework uh, now, um, it's it, the framework itself is is very complicated. Uh, so what we what we've tried to do, because we're interested in educators actually being able to access uh, some of this thinking, uh, is is simplify it to a certain extent. And the basic distinction in the framework is between two ways of of uh, conceptualizing language. Um, one is as a general sociocognitive phenomenon, um, which I have use this term L language uh, to try to distinguish it from other conceptualizations of language. So this is the case of um, the language capacity, the human language capacity. Um, but then we also think about language, conceptualized language as a collection of distinct named codes, uh, sets of regulative norms, which index um, national identities. This I've called N language, which uh, uh, quite serendipitously, uh, the N there is great, it stands for a named language, right? So we split L language into named codes associated with nations, uh, which are normed and have native speakers. So we've got this basic distinction, and we can then use this to look at English uh, and say that English exists in different ways, and certainly in two main senses, uh, by virtue of this, this uh, distinction. So um, it exists by virtue of the existence of language as a human capacity, L language, independent of our awareness of it. So even if we didn't have um, a word for English, English would exist in this way as idiolectal repertoires for doing stuff, for languaging, okay? But it also exists by um, virtue of the second ontological category there, um, as a manifestation of English identity. So part of the uh, ontological category of nation here, 
Um, and here it's sort of sanctioned or licensed by the original existence of a group of people called also English, yeah, the English um, or English people. And now, of course, uh, this has been transferred to much larger groups who uh, trace a cultural lineage with this group. So we've got two different ways in which uh, English is being um, conceptualized here. And we can use this basic distinction to uh, analyze some of the ideological beliefs and try to tease apart the, ide the, um, the ontological aspects of, of English and other languages and the values that are associated with them. So what, what we did here was um, then to um, try to identify a set of what we've called ontological propositions. And these are basically the dominant ontologies that we can see reflected in the, in the discourse data. Now, of course, we're not saying that these are um, the ontologies held by all teachers at all times in the data. And Claire has um, uh, pointed out where some of the ideological beliefs are, are, are not uniformly held by everyone at all times. So first, um, some the, uh, beliefs about English. And that core one is that the legitimate manifestation of language in England is N English, yeah, this normed version. Now, because we want to make this accessible, um, I've also kind of translated these into ordinary language. So basically this proposition says, proper English people speak proper English. And uh, Claire's data um, shows this up. Uh, here's a couple of examples where uh, what you've got proper English people being um, defined also in a racialized uh, uh, kind of way as well. So Thomas talking about uh, his indigenous white children who have unenriched language, yeah, so not proper English. And white children's English was poor, again, not proper. So that's the kind of the, this core uh, proposition about what, what English, how English is being conceptualized within this context. And what you, what you see then is that for non-English people, um, those people who are, who are not uh, self-identified as English, when they lack English, what they're lacking is not N English, but L English. They're being construed as lacking language itself as a communicative capacity. Um, so in ordinary language in England, if you don't have English, you're actually linguistically impaired. And this is what we've seen in the, in the data from uh, Claire's work, where people who don't have English have no language at all, yeah? or they come back to school when they've got more language. Um, so you get a, 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 an interesting conflation, of, a, an in, um, sorry, an inconsistent way of construing language in these first two um, propositions. Um, <clears throat> and if we move then to beliefs about languages beyond English, um, what you see is that the languages of non-English people are construed by these teachers in the dominant uh, sense as N languages of the nations they're identified with rather than these L language resources. Um, so again, in ordinary colloquial language in England, if you're not English and have other languages, then they're gonna be components of your identity, not your linguistic ability. And we've seen this in uh, the extracts from Lucy and Helen that uh, Claire referred to earlier. It's part of their culture. It's part of their identity. Yeah. Um, it's not really about doing things with language, actually getting stuff done. Now, now that we are looking at beliefs about languages beyond English, um, an alternative way in which these languages are construed is as school subjects. Um, and this is really where um, the teachers are thinking about um, the languages of non-English people that English people actually tend to learn through education. And so these are seen as um, in language, but in terms of regulative norms, yeah, rules, vocabulary, uh, divorced normally from both identity and L language resources. So again, in ordinary language, this proposition says, in England, other languages you learn are school subjects, independent of social identity and use. <clears throat> and we see this um, 
especially when teachers are making reference to these higher valued languages. Um, so uh, Luke talks about promoting French and it seems from that bit of discourse there, our interpretation is that uh, he's wanting to say that encouraging the children to switch from their languages to these school subjects like French. And we got the same uh, kind of uh, um, um, different way of conceptualizing different other languages from Habib who says, yeah, you've got French and Chinese, people go away and, and study that. That's different from these, uh, uh, the languages that most of these kids are bringing to, the, to their classrooms. So this then, Proposition D, um, takes us back to English again. And uh, what we get in this final proposition then is that the English, that non-English people actually learn, so back in the educational, uh, setting is actually a system of these regulative norms again rather than the actual language that people need for uh, communication and identity work so in ordinary language again in England if you learn English but aren't English your English is viewed in terms of how well it matches the linguistic system of the standard variety yeah this is the regulative norms independently of how effective you are languaging as a verb. And we see this in um, the way in which um, English is being um, seen by the teachers as, as uh, the English of these um, kids is being seen as something that is really about problems. It's about interventions, remedies, um, testing, uh, and uh, really not much about uh, using resources. Okay, so I think we're roughly on time um, to start uh, um, looking at some conclusions and I'm gonna pass over to Claire again for some, um, uh, to talk through some of the implications of this work. The main conclusion is um, that the educators that uh, we were looking at conceptualized languages in conflicting and inconsistent ways. Uh, and this is to do with the values that are being attached to these different ontological readings of what English and other languages are. Proposition A, for example, captures this really strong entrenched ontological commitment uh, that teachers and many others have, uh, according to which the legitimate manifestation of language is not uh, in England is not as a communicative resource, but as standard English, which, uh, although you might think is a linguistic system, its real meaning here, the way it's um, conceptualized, is um, closely linked to national identity. Proposition B reverses this uh, for non English people. So when they lack English in England, what they're lacking is the communicative resource um, rather than the regulative norms. Um, so there's an inconsistency here. And then if we take the final proposition, which comes back to English, um, we'll see that when people do, when non-English people do have competence in English, again, it's conceptualized as a set of regulative norms. So these are norms that they tend not to reach. This is the uh, deficit kind of position here. So in a way, they're sort of damned either, either way. Um, if they lack English, what they're lacking is uh, ability to, to use language. If they have English, what they've got is something unreachable, which is tied only to native speakers. So for languages um, beyond English, uh, our conclusion is that you've got similar inconsistencies here. Um, and these, the two, the ways of construing both English and languages beyond English uh, are um, flipping between these, these different ways of uh, categorizing language ontologically. So um, they are again languages beyond English when they are um, uh, spoken by uh, non English people in England. They're seen as part of N language indices of national identity not communicative resources. 
uh, when English people study languages in schools, this time they're not indices of national identity or communicative resources, they're kind of abstract sets of regulative norms. So it's a mess, basically. What we've got then is a selective and subconscious conflation of these different ways in which language and languages are conceptualized. And this results in part from the values that are being attributed to uh, the different languages involved. And this contributes, we conclude, to the perpetuation of social injustices for EAL students. So I'll now pass over to Claire for some implications of this. Thank you. Um, so this call that we see here in 2017 for educators to be given the space to develop um, ideological clarity, so an understanding of one's own ideological beliefs, um, remains very valuable, but we would also advocate for space for language educators, those who are likely to be focused on working with um, children in mainstream schools, for example, with dominant languages such as English, so taking it potentially beyond the UK context, of course, to also have the space to develop an ontological clarity, um, which may perhaps um, help to pull apart some of these uh, categories, um, de-link the ontological ca uh, categories of, of language and nation, and begin to appreciate English rather more as Englishes, uh, rather than the monolithic approach to standard English that we see reflected uh, across most of this data set. Also, by doing this, um, giving this space for the development of clarity, both ideological and ontological, um, we can also maybe um, encourage recognition of the ambiguity of the word rule and a move to thinking about conventions, perhaps instead. So practically, um, we have um, already made recommendations in, in our paper, um, as well as some activities that uh, Chris has explored in an online course for, for teachers, Changing Englishes um, Online. Now, this course was initially developed for uh, teachers working in, in TESOL. Um, but what we're finding interesting is to think about how we could perhaps move that within the mainstream to teachers who find themselves working with bilingual children increasingly in, in areas of, of the UK, at least, where they have hitherto not had to, had to do that. So we're, we're working on expanding some of these resources and, uh, and, and seeing if we can do some of this, of this work. Um, do you take over again or should I actually conclude there? <laughs> I think that's where we... I've got one happens next. <laughs> so, um, yes, thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, here are some of our references and we're happy to take questions. I've already seen one arrive in the chat. So I'm already thinking about that response, but happy to uh, um, answer so any thank others. you so much, um, Claire and Chris, for sharing these insightful thoughts about something so complex and difficult. Um, so